Hello and welcome to Portfolio Matters Weekly Update Week 95. But before we get into it, Richard will read the disclaimer. Thank you, Keith. Everything discussed during the Portfolio Matters podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. Listeners should be aware that we will be discussing securities that we own or have a financial interest in. Please do your own research and consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. A full disclaimer can be found at the end. What have we got this week, Keith? Thank you, Richard. We have a packed schedule as usual. But before we get going, pub night. By popular demand, we're going to squeeze one in before Christmas on Monday the 19th of December at the Princess Louise in High Hoban. We hope to see you there. I see they've just done their bar up, Keith. (laughs) Well, this isn't actually from there, but (laughs) let's hope they've put some decorations up. Okay, news this week. Well, we have previously talked about how the rising dollar and rising US interest rates was going to put pressure on emerging market countries. And earlier in the year, we had the default from Sri Lanka. Well, this week, Ghana called in the IMF. And we're expecting more countries, more emerging market countries to follow them in into financial difficulties. COVID lockdowns continue in China. It's not getting better, the situation there. We have some charts for you. Uh, China also has ordered banks to lend $162 billion to the property sector to try and finish, get them to finish all these unfinished buildings. But we are sceptical that that will lead to sustained recovery in the Chinese property sector. Russia has threatened further cuts to European gas supplies after accusing Ukraine of siphoning off gas melt for Moldova. Spain has announced it will compensate mortgage holders for rises in interest rates, which is interesting, and rather defeats the, the object of rising interest rates. The point of rising interest rates is to reduce demand. And then if the government then compensates mortgage holders, then that's okay if the government also raises taxes. But I don't believe they're going to do that. So the Eurozone is a mess. And of course, the Football World Cup has begun. Some charts related to the news. Well, If you haven't seen this, the cost of the World Cup in Qatar is absolutely catastrophic. Presumably that's because they've built loads of stadia, Keith. Yeah. What are they going to do with them when this stadium, this uh, tournament's over? Uh, Turn them into, uh, I don't know, turn them into something. Yeah. It is insane, isn't it? Yeah, that's an astonishing number. Why couldn't they held the World Cup somewhere where there are already loads of stadiums? You've seen that. If you hold it in France or Germany, it costs absolutely nothing. They've um, they've built it with the profits from selling gas to us. Yes, exactly. Now, oil had a very volatile week, and we'll show you later when it's down on the week. But on Monday, the Wall Street Journal reported that OPEC were going to raise production, leading to a very sharp sell-off until... OPEC denied the rumours, at which point it bounced right back. So, who made, someone made a lot of money out of that, I bet. Yeah, exactly. And this is China. Their zero COVID policy ain't going well. Well, given that Omicron has a, an R number of about 10, I think, it, it's doomed to failure. Yeah, absolutely. But still, the trouble is with one-party states, is that any admission of failure, the the leader loses face and therefore tends to double down. And that seems to be the case in China. They just have no exit strategy from this idiotic policy. And these are the cities in lockdown in China as of Wednesday. And frankly, the recent... um, bear market rally in 
<laughs> market. Is, can I just interrupt you? That is a fantastic photograph. <laughs> <laughs> and I, the point, absolutely, is the, the photographer is looking in exactly the wrong direction. Precisely, yes. And in fact, I've just find the recent bear market rally mystifying. In fact, it's kept on so long. <laughs> All the data, as we show you, is continues to deteriorate. Okay, on to this week's economic data. Uh, now, we had a, dis a debate on the Discord last week about my using beat or miss to describe data and yeah. how it's potentially confusing. And therefore, I've added an extra column and I've changed the way we're going to describe data. So I'm going to say whether it's better or worse than expectations and also whether it's up or down versus the prior month. Now, the, um, the problem with better or worse, Keith, is, is that it depends on your point of view. But I think, you're, I think it's uh, missing and beating is difficult when, when bad news is, is worse than expected and it's a beat or a minute. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, it can be confusing. Exactly. So last week, for example, the inflation numbers came in higher than expectations and i described that as a beat and yeah. you know that's problematic yeah. so anyway if um please give us your feedback on the changes so the big news this week was the pmis we got pmis for the uk the eu and the us now i'm not going to go through all of these but the general picture pause take a look is that in the UK and Europe, PMIs generally beat expectations. They were better than last month and better than expectations, but still below 50. So the general picture in Europe and the UK is of an economy that is in contraction, but not deteriorating. The big action was in the US, the bottom rows on this table. They show that the US economy is contracting faster than expected. The PMIs all missed expectations and were down on last month and below 50. So the picture they paint is of a US economy that is deteriorating and now contracting. And that's important. Richard, some charts. Hey, Keith. Um, UK Consumer Confidence Index is looking pretty sick, actually. Um, I don't think we can take that little tick up as being anything significant at this point. And of course, UK inflation is high and pay rates haven't kept up with inflation by any means. UK, UK retail sales month on month had a bit of a um, a good month, and um, I wouldn't particularly know why that is, because it flies in the face of uh, reduced mm. discretionary expenditure. Yeah. Maybe people getting ready for Christmas, doing a bit of a pre-Christmas splurge. Uh, retail sales year on year have been uh, around about down 6% for the whole of this year. Uh, UK public sector borrowing. Is this, a, is this a miss or a beat, Keith? This is, is a beat, actually. Because the market was expecting the um, the fuel costs, the fuel yeah. subsidy costs to be higher than they actually have turned out to be. Yeah. So, uh, however, UK public sector borrowing is still pretty dreadful in terms of the quantity that is required. And the global manu the EU manufacturing PMI is, as Keith rightly says, still below 50, but just a little bit of an upward move last month and the services pmi staying below 50 for the eu and also the composite pmi also below 50 so the eu can in contraction according to these this information the eu consumer confidence is dreadful um we'll have to see whether 28 or, or so was the nadir or whether mm. it uh yeah i think we just have to wait and see a couple of months that is a very poor reading. US existing home sales still month on month still falling. US manufacturing PMI below 50 and fairly significant downtrend there. 
uh, services PMI following a similar downtrend and now seems to be firmly below 50. And the composite mixture of the two, a downtrend in a downtrend below 50. So this is the October durable goods order month on month. And um, the uh, it doesn't equate to the PMI figure because that is November's PMI. US existing home sales, continu sales continuing to drop very sharply. US initial jobless claims. I mean, it's too early to say it's rising. It, there's a sort of wave pattern in there, and it's just in the middle of the wave pattern towards the top end of it. Yeah, I should say the market took this figure badly, and the dollar dropped when this number came out as the market began to discount um, a US recession. Yeah, and a reduction of interest rates. Yeah. Continuing jobless claims is uh, in a little bit of an uptrend nowhere near where it was a year ago of course a year ago it was coming down after covid 30-year mortgage rate has temporarily peaked and, and we know we will see whether it's a permanent peak yeah that's still very high compared to last year yeah so the economy is the pma pmi data really shows that the economies of the uk and europe have stabilized um whether that lasts we may be seen they are contracting, but not an, at an accelerating rate. The US PMI is worse than in Europe and suggests the US economy is contracting at an accelerating rate, particularly the manufacturing PMI, I would say. Mm. So is the world entering a coordinated contraction? Or have we entered a coordinated contraction? Yes. Well, my view, our view, is that yes. we can. Great. Thanks, Richard. On to one chart. And this chart shows energy expenditures for OECD countries. And you'll see that over the course of the last year, they're up something like 70%. So if we look at the GDP formula, you see that because we import, the UK and Europe imports most of its energy or a large proportion of its energy, that must cause European and UK GDP to fall unless there's an offsetting increase in government expenditure, which in the UK we know is not the case, an increase in exports, which sadly we know is very much not the case, or a decrease in savings, which perhaps there is, but eventually consumers will run out of money. Now, in the UK and Europe, we know that there, there are excess savings from the pandemic, but the bottom 40% of the population in the UK have essentially exhausted those savings. So the possibility of further decreases in savings is simply not there. And that means that GDP is likely to fall. So looking at Inflation Watch, uh, there are no new figures. So this is the same table that we showed you last month. There are a lot of speeches from Fed officials last week. Now, if the Fed uses these speeches, don't they, Keith, to try and manipulate the market without having to change interest rates or do anything. So clearly, if there are 16 speeches, they, these are not uncoordinated, and they all know what they're going to say before they say it. Uh, so there's a message in here the Fed is trying to get out. So we have more rate hikes needed must keep rates at a peak until inflation on track for 2%. Rates could rise to 7%, burn two years in a row on inflation optimism. Still a long way to go on rate hikes. Pause is off the table. Not seeing evidence of underlying demand cooling. Not there yet to pause rate hikes. 75 bips still on the table, no clear evidence of inflation coming down. In other words, they're talking the market up in terms of rates are going to continue. They are going to bear down on inflation hard that is the message that they are giving the markets yeah and they're probably hoping they'll only need to do 50 bips as a consequence of it I well don't i think you're right richard i mean if you look at the uh, mortgage rates chart we showed earlier the market is starting to discount um longer term interest rates and yeah. so mortgage rates are falling but of course 
as that happens, that also stimulates the economy because mortgages get cheaper, etc. And I think the Fed is trying to preempt that and say, you know, don't get carried away with thinking interest rates are going to fall soon. So the Taylor rule is um, what the interest rate should be consistent with hitting and maintaining, hitting a 2% inflation rate target. So the blue line is what the actual rate is. The dashed red line is what the interest rate should be if the Taylor rule is interpreted generously. If the Taylor rule is interpreted more strictly, you get the dotted line. So that suggests, on the basis of the Taylor rule, interest rates somewhere between 5 and 7%. And we currently have 4% rounding. So we've got another 25% increase in interest rates to come to get to the bottom end of the Taylor rule range as we currently stand. And 75 bips rate rise at the next Fed meeting doesn't achieve it. Mm, yeah. What I would say is I expect inflation to come down in the coming months and these two lines to cross at some yeah. stage. Yeah. The global food prices, which peaked in the so in the summer of twenty spring and summer of twenty twenty two, have definitely fallen back now, and the fallback seems to have stabilised. Um, mm -hmm. at around about the index level of 135. And uh, UK used car prices have dropped to a negative year-on-year uh, -year price change rate, mm. which suggests there's a lot less demand for used cars than there was. German producer price inflation fell sharply in October, uh, we know that in the energy costs have been falling in Europe, mm. so that and that's obviously a big input into producer prices. So that's a substantial reduction in pressure. Although no, it's still thirty five percent. Yeah, which but is stonking. It is stonking, but that's year on year. Most of those prices, uh, price rises occurred earlier in the year, and month on month, the figure was negative. I believe. Yeah. So is peak inflation already here? Germany PPI month on month, as Keith said, it's now dropped negative, very quickly negative. Uh, and uh, it may be, we'll have to see. I don't know. I think a lot of it now depends upon what uh, happens in the wage, whether we get move into a wage price spiral or not. I think basically the, the public sector is starting to get quite irritable, isn't it, in terms of pay mm. rises. And I don't think we've seen the end of that yet. But generally speaking, we're not looking at a a 1970s style uh, level of industrial action by any means or this chart doesn't go back to the 1970s mm. so relatively benign at the moment my suspicion is it's going to get a lot worse well there's a lot of noise about strikes but really actually currently it's only the omt in the uk who are now we have the postal services oh yeah but also uh, the nurses i think have got a strike day planned now really Mm. Thank you to Wayne J for sending us this, by the way. Uh, so this is a similar chart for strike days in the US, which actually is, uh, looks quite different to the UK's chart. And the uh, number of small businesses in the US planning on increasing prices is dropping very rapidly. And so hopefully inflation should follow that downwards, well, certainly goods inflation. Yeah. So we, we know the Fed's going to, continue to increase rates despite the fact there seems to be a little bit of a pause in in uh, the increase in inflation uh we suspect that inflation on both sides of the atlantic is in the process of peaking uh i would point out though that in other inflationary times inflation goes in waves and we may yet have a second wave if, mm. if this is indeed the end of the first wave we will not know and uh Monetary policy error in terms of over tightening is becoming more likely if central banks who've got their fingers seriously burned and their reputation seriously damaged by saying inflation was transitory when it clearly wasn't uh, going too far the other way, tightening too much. We've been talking about um, moving into a recessionary environment for six to nine months, most weeks, and we've we think we are moving in, still moving into that recessionary environment. And the, inter the central banks are continuing to raise interest rates into what we think is going to be a significant inflation, inflation a, a significant recession. And the, the lag in the policy 
action of the central banks is enormous and they are in a position now of responding to the data that they should have responded to many months ago. Mm. Yes, absolutely. So they've been slow and late, which means inflation has got out of control and they now need to over tighten. Yes. And that over tightening will have an effect with a lag and is likely to lead to a deeper recession. Yeah. If you think about it, the data we've just shown you, all the data seems to indicate that the world economy is going to into recession. So at that point, you should be cutting interest rates and increasing government spending. But in fact, everywhere around the world, we're doing the opposite because inflation remains elevated. So the danger is when that tight monetary policy and tight fiscal policy starts to have an effect, the recession is deeper and longer than it otherwise would be. So moving on to recession watch. So this is a slightly tricky chart to interpret, I think, but the um, it's an interesting chart. So the, the triangle at zero, where the axes cross, is where you start going into the recession. So then the uh, GDP growth contribution in both directions is then normalized to that point. So you can see that the contribution of residences, durables is fairly significant in the period two years prior to the point at which the recession starts. Services, for example, has a, a much flatter trajectory. Also, so the point at which we are now is that residential accommodation, residential accommodation is starting to move down, uh, non-durables moving down, durables moving down and services moving down, but we haven't got to the zero point yet, we're not in recession. And then after we get to the zero point, they continue to move down very substantially for a long period, for a protracted period of time, before they start to regain their prior position. So the point of this chart is, this is a slow process. Mm -hmm. You do not have to pick the bottom next Thursday. It is a very slow process. And probably- a number of misses with people saying it's over or it hasn't started at all. So it's so an important chart, actually. We do talk, we're talking macroeconomics, and these things evolve very, gen very gently, very gradually. And it's actually your investment time frame. You have to be in there for that period of time. Yeah, that's right. Well, the other thing I'd add about this chart, Richard, is we always go on about the housing cycle, how the housing cycle is the business cycle as a shortcut, shorthand. Yeah. And you can see that here. The yeah. most volatile element is residences. And that causes a lot of the cyclicality in unemployment. Yeah. So US financial conditions have tightened very quickly. And um, what this chart is showing, and I think you probably need to have a good look at this one privately, but you can see that um, on the right hand side, everything, lending standards, Fed funds rate, mortgage rates, uh, the US dollar, everything is leading to a very rapid tightening of the economy, which is forcing the economy to slow down. So we have a synchronized forces sl slowing the economy, which suggests it will start to slow very quickly at some point. And this is the GDP now which is really, uh, this is a six-week uh, snapshot. Mm. Um, and the Atlanta Fed GDP now estimate is growth 3 to 4%, uh, which is actually flies in the face of what Keith and I are saying. I would say that this is a very volatile reading, clearly. And we're talking about... Uh, four-year cycle in that chart we looked at a couple of slides ago. So what's going on in the last few weeks is not necessarily uh, indicative of, of where we are in the cycle. Yeah, but this is um, this does contradict the forward-looking data and the PMIs. And, you know, if you just look at the um, GDP now, you'd think the US economy was actually doing quite well. So... Yeah. 
not sure what's going on there. Yeah, I agree. So this is a chart that shows how GDP now um, functions in, in um, how it functions when related to uh, actual GDP and the blue being GDP now, and it's actually more volatile than GDP. And the other thing I would say is that it's not particularly, if you look at from 2012 to 2020, just pre-pandemic, you know, there's not a lot to choose between them, is there? Mm. So has it been tested? I don't know. Has it been tested during a steep recession? I don't know, but the it generally tends to be more positive than GDP. But when it is positive, you know, I can't see any instances where it's saying GDP growth is positive and it's coming negative. We're saying on the reading of the data for PMIs that the US economy should be slowing and contracting, but yeah. the GDP now is saying the opposite. And based on the history of GDP now, it is unlikely that the US economy is currently contracting, I think is what you could say. I'd, other thing I'd add is this is a piece of original research done by one of our Discord members, Wayne J. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Wayne. Okay, so these are another couple of charts from Wayne, and this one shows U.S. consumer expenditure on food and energy, and it shows that every time expenditure on food and energy spikes, there's a recession. Now, the way I interpret this chart is... This is U.S. consumer non-discretionary spending. And so when U.S. consumers have to spend on food and energy, that means they have less money to spend on discretionary items and the economy slows. Now, in the next chart, he adds back in services and the effect becomes clearer. So... Every time you get a big spike in non-discretionary expenditure, you get a recession, the only exception being in 2007. But right now, we've seen a big spike in non-discretionary expenditure. The Goldman Sachs have estimated the probability of a US recession next year at 35%. And the uh, average probability of a recession by... Uh, the general collection of forecasters is 65%. So Goldman Sachs are more optimistic about the economy than most of the people who provide projections. Mm. The 10-year, two, two-year yield curve has gone negative, and uh, it's gone substantially negative, if you look. It's the most negative it's been since, this, at least with this chart, the late 1980s. In fact, as we say there, since 1981, which is indicative of a recession, an impending recession. I think recessions tend to start sometime after the yield curve has inverted. Yeah, up to a not year a, after. Yeah, it's not a contemporary signal. So we are looking still at expecting a recession next year. Yeah. And uh, this is a chart that shows the uh, US yield curve inversions and their relationship to recessions. So you can see there's a very significant correlation between basically a yield curve inversion and the beginning of a recession. And US Conference Board leading indicators contracted for eight months in a row. And that is also indicative of a recession coming. And the Empire State Survey demand outlook is uh, showing a significant negative because mostly this uh, index is between 20 and 50 and it's now about minus six uh worse than in 2008 far worse than covid noticeably mm. yeah and this survey the manufacturing survey looks like it is signaling a significant recession is on the way layoff news stories are surging again um, increasing unemployment putting down with pressure on inflation but um also a sign of an impending recession. 
that as you um, as we know from the charts that we've been looked, looking at over the last few months, employment in the US is still high. Mm. But when you look at these charts, you do get the impression that at some stage the dam is going to break, that the US economy will rapidly contract. Because when you look at that empire state new orders, I mean, those are really bad numbers. And the size of this spike in the uh, mentions of layoffs, you know. Massive. Massive. I mean, that's a very good point, Keith. These things, they tend to, they don't tend to break in a in a nice, neat, downward sloping line. They tend to be discontinuities. And um, the, the pressure on the system increases and increases. Suddenly something gives way and, it, mm. and everything looks horrible. And you may well be right that actually it's going to suddenly fall off a cliff. Because also there are these very strong feedback loops. You know, yeah. People get laid off. They stop spending. The coffee shops go bust, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And US home buyers are cancelling purchase commitments. Um, so basically... I suspect a combination of suddenly they're not affordable and also people thinking, what well, we don't want to be buying at the top of the market if it's falling. And that is a self-reinforcing cycle as well. Yeah. And also, I would add that the tick down in mortgage rates adds to the incentives to cancel in the expectation that mortgage rates may come down further in future. Yeah. You can earn a better return on US six month treasuries at 4.6% than you can on um, real estate currently, which is yielding 4.4% generally. So, the question why would you buy real estate when you get a better return on the six month treasury, which you can buy and sell very quickly and you don't have transaction costs for? The balance of US consumers are going to be cutting expenditure this Christmas, uh, which doesn't come as a surprise. But clearly, that is going to be bad for the retail sector, particularly. This is showing spending during the holiday season. The red line, you know, coming up to October is this year. And uh, we'll have to wait and see where it goes. But mm. it's slightly below last year's at the moment. Yeah. And I would put this in the context of the Atlanta Fed GDP now. This right. is not a strong, this is not growth. Yeah. So I'm puzzled about why the Atlanta Fed GDP now number is so strong. Yes. This is the um, excess savings moving into dissaving, and there's still a substantial amount of excess savings to be spent before they've all gone. Um, and if they do all go, then that driver of economic activity will vanish. And uh, I think, as we discussed previously, the excess savings are concentrated in the top quintile, um, which means they won't need to spend it. The first three quintiles are probably the most uh, uh, susceptible to the loss of discretionary expenditure, and they're the ones with fewest excess savings. Mm -hmm. So that effect is going to come out relatively quickly. So Bank of America customers who spend more than they make each month is um, is increasing. I found this really frightening. Yeah. Yeah, so credit protection got very, very expensive in the summer when interest rates were rising rapidly and the Fed moved from transient to less transient. Um, and now credit uh, protection is much cheaper. Uh, because I think the market is thinking interest rates are going to fall. Well, I just find this absolutely mystifying. We know, you know, all the data we've just shown seems to indicate the US economy is going to be slowing quite rapidly. Yeah. And that is going to put pressure on corporate earnings and corporate solvency. Yeah. But we've had this bear market rally in pretty much all risk assets over the last few weeks. Yeah. It just it mystifies me. I completely agree, Keith. I completely agree. So recession is coming in summary. We continue to believe that uh, leading indicators have been forecasting that the recession is going to start probably in 2023. The GDP now forecast is basically the only thing that is suggesting that um, we 
may not be moving into a recession, but um, it is, yeah, I mean, it's a short, it's a very short run forecast and uh, it doesn't tally at all with other data. Mm. Okay, thank you, Richard. On to the European Energy Crisis Watch. And last week we discussed the wow. polar vortex. Well, it's getting bigger and colder. It's now the, at the heart, it's minus 88 degrees C. Extraordinary. And that means that when it escapes, there's going to be a lot of cold air flowing somewhere south. Now, forecasts are that Europe will have a cold spell starting from the 2nd of December. Expect snow, good for skiers. And by the 9th, it's going to be really cold. So the blue, light blue, is zero and below. Even the UK is going to freeze. Central Europe is going to be very cold. It does make you wonder what's going to happen to, as I'm sure you're talking about, Keith, what's going to happen to energy demand in Europe? Yep. Well, looking first at electricity, you'll see that electricity prices in Germany have leapt over the last couple of weeks. In the UK, they're stable at pretty high levels. Now, in France, they are really high. So these are these charts all show the price of electricity in euros per megawatt hour for Europe. And in France, they're 422 euros per megawatt hour. That is over 50% higher than the German figure of 260. And Italian electricity prices are also climbing. The We'll get into this in a minute, but France is having problems with nuclear reactors and it exports a lot of electricity to Italy. So Italian electricity prices are following French electricity prices higher. Now, this chart shows imports of gas to various European countries, and the red bars are LNG. And you'll notice Germany hasn't got any. So Germany has been importing gas from other countries via pipelines, but not LNG. Now, it's just built this new regasification terminal. So that will change. But as a result, you see that German gas imports have fallen in 2022, whereas in the other countries, they've held up. Now, in France, during the summer, a lot of the nuclear reactors were closed down after cracks were found in various pipes and maintenance work needs to be redone. Now, what happened during this week was that the French have announced that they will be slower in restarting those nuclear reactors. And so the blue line is forecast nuclear capacity for those reactors. And so you see they'll be back online later. And this is nuclear power output and we're well down on previous years currently and this is the prediction for power output over the winter and so a significant for shortfall compared to other years and also uh italy and france are having a nasty little spat about immigration and mm. Uh, you can quite easily see the French say, well, we'll make sure we're OK first for exporting energy, any energy to Italy. Yes, good point. French have invested heavily in nuclear, which means they have much lower carbon, um, carbon emissions than Germany. But they haven't re the problem is that they haven't been maintaining them properly and actually haven't built any new ones yeah. so going forward the likelihood is that power output will become less reliable as they have further maintenance issues as these reactors age 
The problem has been that the Greta Thunbergs of this world have said no to fossil fuels and no to nuclear. We can do it all with windmills and solar farms. And that is arrant nonsense. But politicians have been scared to say so because it hasn't deemed to be uh, a vote a vote winning strategy. And um, now we've got the position, and that's why they haven't maintained and built them, built new ones in France. Mm -hmm. That's why we haven't built new ones. Um, and the chickens are coming home to roost. But the you know, we pay our politicians to actually think, don't we, in theory. Angela Merkel has a chemistry degree, you, you know, a science degree. You'd have thought she would have understood this, wouldn't you? Well, but the thing is, everyone bows to popular pressure and people are scared of nuclear power, particularly after Chernobyl, and yeah. nobody wants a nuclear power station near them. And yeah, it's got yeah. to go near somebody. I would say North London rather than South London, purely from <laughs> a distribution point of view. <laughs> yes. Richard lives in South London. <laughs> <laughs> I live in North London. Okay, so this is gas storage levels in Europe, and they are currently very high. Gas prices, we'll go through later, have they're down, well down for their peak, but they've just started to rise again. And these are natural gas inventories, actually much better than last year. All these charts from John Kemp at Reuters. So gas inventories n close to all-time highs for this time of year. But we're now entering the period where we start drawing down those stocks rather than building them. So whether we get through the winter without power cuts depends on how deep the winter is and how much people conserve gas relative to other years. In my house, we still actually haven't turned on the central heating in the upper floors. We turn our central heating on and off as we think we want it. We right. haven't got it on. We haven't set it on auto at all. And this is interesting. So gas intensive industries in Europe are all suffering. So it's the PMIs is the blue lines and the business climate is the red lines, which are really bad. But 75% of German in companies are saying that they've managed to save gas without reducing output. And so this chart would, ha would have you believe that German industry has become much more efficient in its use of gas. But of course, a lot of companies don't use much gas. And the other 25% who use it intensively have been very badly affected, as illustrated by the industrial production numbers for the chemical and pharmaceutical sectors. So again, it's one of those instances you need to be quite careful about how you interpret these charts. I think there has been some energy savings but as in everything it's quite easy to make small changes and then increasingly difficult to save larger amounts and Richard asked last week whether the sea ice was growing in the Arctic and the answer is yes so in conclusion winter is coming it looks like there's going to be quite a hard cold snap in Europe. And that will mean we're going to start drawing down those, those big stocks of gas in storage. Um, and unfortunately, the French nuclear reactors are not going to help with electricity supply. So, so whether we get through this winter without power cuts it will depend on the severity of the winter. Okay, now on to... The ECB TLTROs, that's targeted long-term refinancing operations. Okay, so what are they? Well, these are cheap loans to European banks. So, so the ECB has lent 2.2 trillion euros to European banks at negative interest rates. And they are now 
going to stop doing so and call those loans in over the next year. And that will reduce bank profitability and reduce liquidity. Now, the reason they did this is that as interest rates approach zero in the euro land, so they monetary policy, instead of becoming stimulative, actually became contractionary because they were destroying the profitability of the banking sector and reducing the incentives for banks to lend money. So what the TLTROs were designed to do was to provide the banks with very cheap money in if they lent it out. So the TLTROs came with conditions that the money had to be lent out. So Keith, I've just um, I've just Googled um, Eurozone GDP. Mm -hmm. And the Eurozone GDP in 2022 was around about 14.5 trillion. That means the ECB is calling in 14% if it's 2 trillion one seventh, 14% of GDP over 12 months. Mm. Yeah. Or that's their plan. Well, I don't think a lot of it was lent out. I think a lot of it was sat on the books of the ECB. And the ECB estimates that that 2.2 trillion only led to a 5% increase in bank lending. If you think of the average interest rates on these TLTROs was minus 0.5%. The ECB essentially was subsidizing the European banking sector to the tune of 0.5 times 2.2 trillion or 10 billion a year, so that's, which is now going to be taking back. And that is where that, that goes into their bottom line. And why, why is it the banks are so profitable? But I hope they all took their big bonuses because they jolly well deserve them <laughs> at the taxpayer's expense. Yes. So most attractive TLTROs rates ended last year and the TLTROs begin to net mature next year and by 2024 will mainly have matured. And as the, those TLTROs are withdrawn, the banks will need to raise alternative capital. That will mean issuing bonds or equity and financial conditions will tighten. So this is the value of TLTROs in issuance. And you see it's absolutely enormous. So left-hand scale for the bars is about 2.2 trillion. And they've already started to come off and they will be gone by mid-2024. And that is a lot of liquidity being taken out of the system. As interest rates have risen over the last year, these very cheap um, funding issued to the banks has been a huge subsidy, essentially. And that has provided a lot of extra liquidity to the markets. Over the course of the next two years, there's going to, these TLTROs are going to have to be repaid and the bank's going to have to raise extra funding from the markets through bonds, etc. So all that adds up to uh, tightening financial conditions in the Eurozone. Mm. And that's uh, actually good for the Euro, bad for um, potentially bad for the economy. Yeah. So we'll now look at the GDP price deflator, which, if you remember, was a question uh, we posed last week. And how does it actually work moving from real GDP to nominal GDP? CPI measures price changes in goods and services purchased by consumers. GDP is a measure of the economic activity of consumers, businesses, government, exporters, and importers. So CPI only measures price changes for a small sector of, the, of GDP activity. So the GDP deflator measures price changes in goods and services purchased by consumers, businesses, governments, and foreigners, but not importers, because foreign production 
It's not included in GDP. If you remember, if we import more oil, it actually reduces GDP. So the, uh, there needs to be an adjustment made to CPI to come to the GDP deflator. So this is a chart showing the uh, CPI versus the, the GDP deflator. And you can see that if you put them at both at, at zero, index them to 100 in 1990, um, CPI is now, or actually in 2015, would be at 180, uh, and GDP deflated at 160. So there's like a 25% difference between the two over time. And actually, they are fairly much straight lines with just a gradual divergence. Um, so uh, that's how GDP is deflated and clearly it tends to be deflated by less than CPI. So when we take GDP and normalize it in our heads, we have to think that the deflator being used is less than the CPI figure we're seeing, probably. Mm. And that's thank you, thank big thanks to Stuart Owen for producing this little explanation for us, and of course the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. So, as I said, CPI consistently higher than GDP price deflator. This chart goes up to 2022, and uh, you can see the rapid rise in CPI has been reflected in a much smaller rise in the GDP deflator. Okay, so this is the um, GDP price deflator divided by CPI, and it shows you how the two have diverged. And most of the divergence occurred between 1980 and 2010, and essentially was caused by globalization. And what we think has happened is that businesses benefited a lot from globalization in the form of reduced costs, but they didn't pass that those cost benefits on to consumers. So we see that in the form of rising profit margins for businesses, for example. And that is the cause of the divergence between the GDP price deflator and CPI. Consumers have faced higher pri price inflation than have businesses is the bottom line. Basically, the GDP deflated measures basket of commodities, um, which changes according to economic uh, activity. While CPI always indicates the uh, this fixed basket of, of uh, consumer consumption. Uh, the GDP deflator frequently changed the weights that would, that would depend upon the activity within the economy in different sectors. CPI is revised very frequently. And CPI will consider imported goods because they are considered as consumer goods, whereas GDP doesn't include imported goods. GDP deflator doesn't include imported goods. Mm. So just be aware of the differences. Thank you, Richard. Okay, now on to the US dollar. Right. Now, last week, we showed that Deutsche Bank thinks the US dollar is very overvalued. And when it's previously gone above this 20% overvalued um, line, it has tended to mean revert quite sharply. So Deutsche Bank think that the US dollar should fall. Now, we didn't show you this chart last week because Richard and I thought it was a complete mess. But all you need to know is US dollar, they think, is the most expensive currency in the world. The black line is the trade weighted dollar index, and it has decisively broken through its 50 day moving average. Now, has its run ended and actually is a new trend of weakening dollar developing. Now, the reason that the dollar index has had such a strong run is mainly because of the weak yuan and the weak euro and sterling. So between them, Europe and China represent like 
of the dollar index. Without wishing to preempt what you're going to say, Keith, the Chinese economy is undoubtedly in trouble. Mm. And we think the euro area of the economy is in trouble as well. So it doesn't seem likely that those two currencies are going to rise significantly against the dollar in the over the next couple of years, I would have thought. Well, in the case of the yuan, we'll go through that. I agree with you, Richard. But in the case of the euro, I mean, what's happening, everything depends on expectations. And actually, when you look at recent data, actually this week's PMIs, for example, what you're seeing is that relative to expectations, the US economy is weakening and the UK and European economies are resilient. And so far, the European energy crisis, which was a big cause of concern for everyone, yeah. us, the markets, etc., is actually proving to be less severe than anticipated. And that's a very good point, Keith. It's, it's not what's actually happening, it's what is expected to happen, which is yeah. influencing to a significant extent these, these value, relative valuations. Yeah. So if we look at the drivers of dollar strength, you see that the euro area and the yuan have been a big cause of the rise in the dollar index. Following on from just what we've just said, a big cause of the weakness in the euro was concerns about the energy crisis and the war in Ukraine, leading to a uh, loss of confidence in the European economy. And in China, there's been a lot of policy uncertainty and economic uncertainty following the uh, COVID lockdowns, which continue, and also the housing market. But a big driver of dollar strength, in my view, has been aggressive Fed monetary policy, leading to widening yield differentials with the rest of the world. Now, what's changed is that over the last few weeks, the European energy crisis seems to have gone okay as we enter winter and gas prices in Europe have come right down. And actually, the European economy has proven to be remarkably resilient. Now, China have announced a lot of stimulus for infrastructure spending. And this week, they've announced $162 billion of lending into the property sector. So the Chinese economy, once they get out of their COVID lockdowns, could strengthen. But I think the most important point is that expectations for the yield differential have peaked. Weakening US economy means that yields Interest rates will rise further, but then peak and come down. And therefore, markets are looking through that to seeing falling yield differentials starting next year because inflation in the US looks to be peaking. And so the Fed will need to be less aggressive. So this um, game of trades who produced these set of charts, they have a model which they claim has successfully forecast the dollar, which they don't think is overvalued, but they now think over the next 12 months, the dollar will fall by 8%. 8%. 8%. And the main driver for that is falling yield differentials. I mean, one part of this analysis I disagree with is the outlook for China, which I think is likely to continue weakening. And actually, the yuan then was likely to keep on falling. And in Europe, certainly currently, we have reduced economic uncertainty, although that could all change depending on how bad the winter crisis gets, energy crisis gets. So in summary, US dollar has had a very good run 
driven by economic uncertainty in Europe and China and rising interest rate differentials, and those are now fading. The dollar is certainly very overvalued relative to other currencies in PPP terms. And the dollar has now started to come down. Is that a new trend? So my view, well, viewers will know that I bought back into the dollar back in July, mainly because I expected the then incoming trust government to implement their radical tax cutting agenda, which would be disastrous for sterling. All of that came true. But since then, a lot has happened since sterling fell to 104. The UK has a new government who is fiscally conservative. They have raised taxes and cut spending. The European energy crisis currently looks to be going quite well. And so that reduces economic uncertainty in Europe. And But most importantly, US inflation appears to be peaking. And with it, comes the expectation of a peak in US interest rates. And as interest rates are cut going into recession, so yield differentials will fall. And so that means that the outlook for the dollar is uncertain. And I've therefore closed my US dollar long position with a small net profit, although it would have been much better to have done it after Liz Truss's mini budget 104 than now. But the one thing, as but as we've discussed previously, what I failed to anticipate was the how the shenanigans in the gilt market would lead to the fall of the trust government and a fiscally conservative new regime coming in. Mm. But all of that may yet change. The if the European energy crisis becomes severe due to very cold weather, then a lot of policy uncertainty could return, leading to a sell-off in the euro and sterling and a strengthening dollar. Don't know, but I only put a trade on when I'm certain. And right now, I'm not certain, so I've taken it off. The next section is quite short, but is actually incredibly important. And I'm going to cut it out and put it out as a separate podcast so it's searchable. And that's the capital cycle. Now, if you invest in any capital intensive industries, you really need to be aware of this. So the way the capital cycle works is that, for whatever reason, there is a shortage and prices go up. Companies respond to high prices and extraordinary profitability by investing in new capacity. And when that capacity hits the market, there's a glut, prices collapse, and the whole cycle starts again. Because low prices means no investment, and eventually there's a lack of capacity causing high prices. Now, we are seeing that in spades in freight. So during the pandemic, international shipping rates went through the roof. They went up tenfold. And so companies invested in new container ships. And you'll see this is... Con- Container ships being delivered by year. And in 2023 and 2024, you're going to see a lot of big container ships hitting the market just as prices collapse. And that will cause prices to go very low. When, so when investing in any capital intensive industry, you need to be aware of the capital cycle. In the case of freight, Freight is now uninvestable because they've overinvested and rates are going to collapse as is profitability. Now, in oil and gas, we know that CapEx has collapsed since 2014 and remains very low. So the capital cycle 
is working in favor of oil and gas at the moment. So in summary, capital cycle is really important. Low prices cause low investment, and eventually that low investment causes a lack of capacity which feeds into high prices, overinvestment, and a glut. Now, in shipping, we're seeing that playing out in real time. Shipping is now completely uninvestable. But oil and gas, the capex cycle, is very much working in our favor. And when the world economy recovers from recession, supplies are still tight. Prices will rise quickly. Richard. Yeah, very interesting, Keith. And uh, really important to um, keep an eye on. It's a little bit like um, the in, um, poor investment decision where you buy at the top and sell at the bottom, mm. um, but only on an industrial scale. And you don't want to be an investor in that industry buying at the top and selling at the bottom. So you're quite right. It's really important. And I think this is the um, it's the same principle that we're looking at, isn't it, for um, metals that are required for the conversion, the greening of the economy, if the effect of the investment that's being made in those is far too low for the future expected demand, uh, which is why at the right point, they will be at the bottom of their capital cycle. But we need to get into the recession first, I think. Yes. OK, on to other charts, Richard. Thank you, Keith. Credit Suisse is in some difficulty. It's been in some difficulty for a long time, actually. And it's, if you look at its share price chart, it's absolutely appalling. It's lost 1.6 billion in the fourth quarter. So apparently clients withdrew 80 billion of funds. Um, now, I'm not quite, the something doesn't add up to me with the Credit Suisse. So it is, it is thought that the, that the Fed sent significant numbers of dollar swaps, swaps to Switzerland in order that Credit Suisse's financial difficulties could be funded and that Credit Suisse didn't implode. Now, a loss of 1.6 billion, whilst to you and I, Keith, it's a chunk of money to a, a systemically important um, bank. I was going to say criminal enterprise, but uh, <laughs> to a systemically important bank, 1.6 billion is peanuts. So why did the US have to send such vast quantities of dollar swaps to them? So investors withdrew 80 billion of assets, but that shouldn't require dollar swaps because Credit Suisse should hold those. So there's a big black hole somewhere in Credit Suisse that nobody's telling us about. Yeah, I think that's why people are worried and withdrawing their money. Yeah. Oh, well, there we are. There's a the share price drop. If you have, if only you'd invested at sixty. <laughs> yeah. Well, the market is saying they think Credit Suisse is in trouble. Basically, I, I think it's, yeah, it's going to go bust, isn't it? I suspect it's going to go bust. And one of the things we've talked about is how rising interest rates always cause some sort of financial crisis. Yeah. We're just waiting for it. Yeah. So, you know. Completely. And boy, are they rising, you know, comparatively speaking. Yeah. Some good okay. news, Keith. <laughs> What's we need the good some good news. news? <laughs> well, good news is that, I didn't know this, they've started a 3,000 megawatt, is that a gigawatt, undersea electricity cable that will transport solar power from Egypt to Europe. So the idea is they're going to build huge solar farms in the Egyptian desert and then export it to Europe. I mean, it is the logical thing to do, and it would be great if we did it. It would be, would be wouldn't it? And on to uh, equity market, <clears throat> Richard. A bit of a mixed week for equities. Uh, FTSE will share... Up 1.6, stock to 2.3, S&P 2, and that's that 1.3, but Hang Seng down 2.6, Topics up 2.6. Bitcoin, nothing very much to report, a very non-volatile week for Bitcoin. The pound up 1.9% uh, against the dollar, only down 10% for the year now. Mm. And the euro uh, only down 8.5% for the year. The dollar index only up 10.6% for the year. And the VIX, down 13% to 21.7, um, which is interesting. And the, um, yeah, so generally speaking, actually, a relatively quiet week, I would say. 
yeah, well, I find it mystifying that we're going into a recession and we've had this extraordinary bull, sorry, bear market rally. So the FTSE is now only down 2.5% on the year. Yeah. Amazing. And actually, when you look at VIX, you know, we put in VIX last week and we showed you last week some charts that a successful trading strategy has been to sell VIX below 20 and buy it above 30. And look where it is now. It's at 20.6. So we're getting close to the point where the VIX selling strategy would say to fade this bear market rally. Indeed. So asset managers have increased their bets against the dollar, thinking the dollar is going to fall further. And the recent bear market valley, rally is on shaky ground. So we've got um, US earnings momentum in the light colored line and the 12 months change in global consumer confidence and suggests that earnings momentum is due a bit of a drop. S&P earnings revisions are also falling. And ISM, as we know, is falling. So not a whole lot are going down in concert. The S&P has rallied whilst earnings estimates continue to fall. Yeah, I found this amazing. Yeah. Well, they're hoping, they, in inverted commas, are hoping for the Fed to step in and start QE again. Yeah, but the Fed have said they're not. Yeah. yeah. So this is drawing an analogy between um, where we currently are and the 1946 to 1949 bear market, uh, in which case we will go down... I don't know, however much that said. Anyway, it suggests that the this bear market is not yet over. My personal view is that we go down a lot further than that. Yeah, no, so do I, Richard. I think the point of this chart is actually not that there's an analogy, because, I mean, these charts are always a bit silly, but just look at the volatility of historic bear markets. You know, there are these strong bear market rallies and just don't buy into them. The time to buy is when... You know, there's a trough and everyone's panicking. You don't buy in at the top of, uh, you know, when you've had a good run. Yeah. And earnings recessions last many months. And as do as does the recessionary cycle. Obviously, the two are moving mm. in tandem. And we've only just started ours, so we've got a long way to go. We've got, like, 40 months mm. to go. <laughs> yes, exactly. 40 cheery months in which every week... <laughs> Yes. We will be reporting one piece of good news, at least. Yes. <laughs> the good news this week, you'll know when we're out of recession, because the good news will this week will be no more recession watch. Yeah, that's right. Then, then we'll have to start reporting bad news each week. Yeah, oh, yes, things are <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, Household equity allocations remain very elevated. A lot of, I mean, if there was a real bear market, everybody would be moving out of the... Um, out of the equity market, and everybody isn't moving out of the equity market. So therefore, mm. you know, wait until everybody does. Yes. The vast majority of crypto investors have lost money. So 87, 81% of users, assuming a $1,000 a month investment, not quite sure where they derive this from, but yeah. really, if you invested uh, a year ago, in invested in inverted commas in crypto, um, you wouldn't be doing very well now. <clears throat> yeah. Well, well done for making a profit in crypto, Richard. You must be one of the few people who've done so. Yeah. Thank you, Keith. I mean, I'm, I'm waiting for Bitcoin to drop to 3,000. People, it, it speaks for itself, this this uh, picture and the comment at the side. I find this difficult to believe. 23% of Americans have bought crypto. That seems very high to me. Yeah, I don't know how to um, assess whether it's apt or not. Mm. Crypto current market capitalization. So let, if you look at this chart, 2017 to 2018, it, the peaked trough there was, I mean, it came back in 2018, it came back to about 0.3, I would say. And it rose from where, where the exponential curve started, it rose from about 0.2. This time around, it's it's risen from about 0. Point, let's let's call it 0. 0.3 and therefore if history is any guide it's going to drop to around 0. 0.4 to 0. 0.5 that is the point at which i would buy back in 
Mm. And I believe it's going to go there. Okay. Um, Bankman Fried, I will pronounce his name as it's spelt. Bankman Fried um, did me a favour. Oh, yeah. So when you buy it, Richard, are you going to keep your coins on an exchange? <laughs> Probably, because it's easy. Right. Okay. Well, I'll be interested to see what you do. Fair comment, Keith. Okay. On to commodities. Now, this shows the material required in tonnes per terawatt hour for different forms of energy. And the important point about this chart is, is it's per terawatt hour. And so the point is that because renewables have low energy efficiency, i.e. no energy output, they require a lot of material compared to nuclear or hydrocarbons to produce the same amount of energy. And so if we look at the amount of steel and concrete required by, for example, wind per megawatt compared to coal or nuclear, you're going to need a lot, lot of it. So, And remember that concrete and steel are both very energy intensive. So actually, you need a lot of cheap energy to produce uh, wind turbines. And if we look at how much metal is required to produce a kilowatt of hour of electricity relative to the current mix, we're going to need a lot of metals. So if you look at solar, that yellow circle is silver. We're going to need a hell of a lot more silver relative to the current energy mix if we use a lot of solar going forwards. And the big winners will be silver, copper, tin, <coughs> zinc, and aluminium. One of the fallacies of this energy transition, in my view, is the investment in um, renewables. Because we take what is a, a scarce resource now and we process it into something which gives a very, very poor return on that, that energy investment. And uh, we are saying that the, the solution to the problem is renewables. It's simply, it's simply well, not we, but it mm. simply isn't. And um, it, it's extraordinary that people should consider that where we're in a very energy constrained world, we should be investing vast quantities of energy in a very inefficient method of production mm. in the future. Rant over. Well, I've got a chart coming up, Richard, which will appeal to all of your prejudices. But they're not prejudices, Keith. <laughs> okay, on to energy commodities. And oil had a bad week. Actually, oil had a very volatile week uh, and ended up down on the week. So Brent closed the week at 86, down 5% on the week. WTI was down 4%. European natural gas futures rose as the cold weather started to bite, up best part of 10%. Year to date, they're now up around 80% for uh, TTF and about 73% for UK. US is having a cold snap, and that has led to a 15% rise in the cost of natural gas in the US, although US natural gas still remains a fraction of the price of European natural gas. Rising natural gas prices dragged coal up by 4%, and that is up 105% on the year. Uranium was pretty flat. Okay, some numbers pertaining to the oil market. Now, interesting, there was a build in the US last week, a build of 1.7 million barrels, including the SPR, 3.3 excluding the SPR. So there's still releases from the SPR, but even without the releases, there was a build. Very interesting. Is the US economy starting to slow and is there demand destruction? So US oil production was stable at a very disappointing 12.1 million barrels, hardly grown this year. And the Baker Hughes rig count ticked up by five. This is Brent. So drifted off after its recent rally. And Beneath the headline number, the futures curve has collapsed 
which means that it's no longer worth storing oil because the market sees no problem with future supply relative to current supply. Now, last week, we featured this chart from HFI Research that showed that, surprisingly, global oil inventories were pretty stable, which contradicted a lot of the other data we'd been seeing. And the reason is that this just this is just oil. If we now include the three main products of oil, so gasoline, diesel, etc., inventories are falling. And that is more consistent with the pattern we've been seeing. Um, now, last week we talked about how the UK North Sea now has tax rates of 75%. Well, this table, thank you to Ali Buroyd for sending it to us, shows the super major's effective tax rate, which is around 35%. So international oil companies have much better investments elsewhere in the world. And when you're looking at investing in oil companies, frankly, you want to be avoiding the UK. Yeah. And the super majors will be avoiding the UK when deciding where, where to invest their money. Which ultimately is bad for the UK economy. Precisely. The European natural gas futures ticking up. UK natural gas futures pretty stable, actually, at these uh, levels, which are still a lot higher than last year. US natural gas futures have risen with the cold weather. Coal up only 100% this year. Uranium flat. Now, this is the chart I thought you'd like, Richard. So this is energy generation in Ontario. The blue is nuclear. Mm -hmm. Nice and steady. Yeah. The red spikes are wind. How do you integrate that into the grid? With difficulty, Keith. With difficulty. Yes, I mean, it proves the point, doesn't it? It's, 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 it's bordering on pointless. Well. I know that's not a popular view. Yeah. But, uh, you know, in reality, pragmatic, yeah, we should... it is. I agree with you. I should just build a load of nuclear yeah. in South London. <laughs> we'll have a small nuclear reactor in Greenwich, Keith, far <laughs> enough away. And, you know, you need 200 of these enormous wind turbines to equate to one nuclear plant, and then it would produce way too much electricity at some time and none at others. No. Yeah. And actually, just a, a brief aside, because I thought this was quite interesting. Well, you wouldn't want to do that, would you? Well, actually, you could. could you? If you w went for a swim in the pool that they use to cool down spent nuclear fuel, you'd be absolutely fine. The bottom line is that the water absorbs neutrons, and it does so at a rate where the radiation from spent nuclear fuel halves every seven centimetres. So wow. at the top of the, fuel, the, the pool, you'd feel no effects whatsoever. In fact, you'd have less radiation than walking around the high street, apparently. Um, <clears throat> and um, the, the absorption process produces a blue light called Cherenkov radiation. So you'd be swimming in a sort of blue lit pool. Sounds wonderful, Richard. Might even we, get should, <laughs> we should go to Sellafield. <laughs> the, next, the next edition will be broadcast live from Sellafield, where Keith and I will be taking a dip yeah. in a nuclear fuel rod cooling tank. Is that right? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on to industrial commodities, Richard. Thank you, Keith. Uh, I would say it was a pretty quiet week generally for industrial commodities. Aluminium was down 1.8%. Really, nothing very much move until we get down to nickel, which is still being very volatile. Um, and at 4.2%, I don't think, I think there's um, the LME is not out of the woods as far as nickel is concerned. Mm. I think a tin had a, a bad week and it's down 43%. If you remember last year, it had a fantastic year, didn't it? But this year, it's down 43%. Yeah. Ferro vanadium, pretty much well unchanged, and zinc down a little bit. 2.3%. And there's aluminium. 
pretty steady. Cobalt, very steady. Yeah, I I wonder about the timeliness of the data here. Yeah. Yes, and, and is it really traded? Mm. Uh, copper is is gently moving up actually. Mm. Quite volatile. Uh, chromium pretty stable. A lot of these are off their lows actually. They are, aren't they? Yeah. Iron ore still within that downtrend, but having come up from the bottom line. Lithium stabilized a little bit of the increased price again. Medium, nickel starting to move up, I would say, as Keith says, off its low, well off its lows. Mm. Tin, ferro-vanadium. I have to say the ferro-vanadium redox, uh, sorry, the um, vanadium redox battery seems to have got very quiet, doesn't it? It does. Yeah, we know they're much more expensive than lithium-ion batteries. Yeah. I read today that Massachusetts Institute of Technology have developed a solid-state lithium battery, which doesn't have a lot of the hazards that the um, the current one with organic solvent has. Mm. Uh, zinc. Moving on to precious metals. Again, pretty quiet, weak, really just move, a little bit of moving around. Uh, but nothing very much except palladium, which is down 4.6% for the week, but oh, pretty much unchanged for the year. And uh, for the year, gold down 4%, silver down 8%. But just think of that chart with the amount of s silver required for solar energy. Mm. So there we have gold, silver, platinum, Rhodium and palladium. Great, thank you, Richard. Right, on finally on to rates. So the yield curve is flattening and inverting. So we now have 30 and 50 year rates that are substantially below short term rates. And so the long end, we had falling rates this week. The short end rose a, a touch. In the Eurozone periphery, we actually had very substantial falls in yields of the 10-year. So the Greek 10-year was down 22 basis points on the week, and the Italian down 27. So currently the market, we're having it. So currently we're having this bear market rally in all risk assets, including the Eurozone periphery. But if we the eurozone energy crisis were to worsen, then all that could unwind very quickly. I don't think we're out of the woods yet at all. And this is Goldman Sachs' forecast of the path for Fed uh, interest rates. And so they're forecasting a 50 basis point rise in December, followed by 25 basis points in February, March and May leading to peak of 5.25%. And they're forecasting no cuts at all in 2023. Now, China is steadily dumping treasuries. And the Fed is steadily dumping treasuries as it instigates QT. Recently, both bonds and equities have been positively correlated. So... Bonds have been selling off as equities have been selling off. But if there is a recession, which we're expecting, and interest rates then start to fall, that should reverse. And that is what I'm betting on, essentially. I think now yields start to fall. And we had falling yields at the long end this week. So this is the UK 10-year. Is that a new trend? I very much hope it is. This is the UK 30-year. So you've had this extraordinary sell-off since August, which is now unwinding. US 10-year. US 10-year yield is much higher than UK 10-year now. Is that the start of a new trend? And German, Italian, Greek. And finally, seasonality. Well, Pretty much flat into year end now. And 
one thing I wanted to discuss was the outlook for various asset classes. Now, this is a table sent to us by Spider786. And basically, if you believe the economy is going into recession, then you should be looking at treasuries, gold. And if you're invested in equities, healthcare, and consumer staples. Now, we had a comment last week that Richard and I should be wary of groupthink between the two of us. And actually, I thought, well, we have very different portfolios. So what did we think of the various asset classes and why did we have very different portfolios? Now, you can see our views here and where we differ are bonds. And I, frankly, have gone big into bonds, as Richard agrees, but thinks you should be more cautious. Obviously, a sensible person would be more cautious, but... Uh. And just to elaborate, I mean, I think we should be more cautious because <clears throat> if Keith is right and bonds have um, bottomed, then obviously going and buying uh, heavily now is the right thing to do. But I'm not sure that that is the case yet. So I would say dip a toe in, don't go in as heavily as Keith has gone in. Now, hopefully Keith is right. Um, but uh, that's, that is why I'm, I'm more cautious than Keith is. Yeah. And well, I'd, I'd say, say, I'd say going in later, Richard, is more sensible. You're waiting for the trend to fully develop, developed. But it's also less lucrative. Yes. So, is question of whether your risk reward uh, ratio is and your own personal risk appetite. Precisely. As viewers will know, mine is quite high. So I've gone in now. So on gold, Keith is neutral, which I think we knew from his various comments, and I'm I'm more bullish, as we know. But I would also add in uh, precious metal, well, not precious metals per se, gold and silver. Um, and we just talked about silver and mm. its potential, potential demand from solar energy. That's why I'm bullish on silver. Okay, so concluding comments. Well, the big news of the week was that US PMIs missed expectations and show a US economy that is decisively slowing. We expect a recession in 2023. Richard, what do you have you been up to this week? My week was okay, um, up 1.2% for the week, 5.4% uh, for the year. No purchases and no sales, I'm afraid very boring to report. <clears throat> and uh, a couple of charts. So this is the iShares 20-year bond ETF. Now, look, this is this is uh, US dollars. So um, buying this, you're exposed to the US dollar. But I quite like looking where trends are and where they're going. And I would say if you were to buy this, you would want to wait for it to come out above this trend line, this um, channel line. And you would also want to make sure that it's not going to go back down here. And that's one of the little sort of touchstones that I use when I'm thinking of making a... So this is one of the reasons why I'm not with Keith, because I don't think that there is a strong um, chart formation to uh, enter the trade yet. It's not that I'm, I'm a chartist. It's just one of the tools that I like to use. Keith would say, by well, putting words in your mouth here, Keith, but you're sort of preempting the... What the chart is going to do, which is which is perfectly fine, but it's a different, slightly different approach. Mm. And then it's gold. So gold obviously is in, is within this long longish term range from about uh, twenty mid twenty twenty, and it fell below that range recently. It's come back into it, and the question is, uh, is is there going to be a new trend going up towards twenty one hundred? Uh, Again, I don't know, but if you wanted to buy, you buy here rather than here. So Brent crude, I just like this. I've got, I had a bit of a, a thing this morning, so I did all these things. So Brent crude, uh, Keith is just talking about, um, sorry, Keith is just talking about this. And it's in the middle of its relatively short term downtrend. So it's neither a buy nor a sell, I would say, if you're looking for a longer term signal. It's just watch and wait. And I was really struck by that volatility thing last week. I thought that was quite clever. So this is a weekly chart of the volatility. You can see the ranges, um, uh, the, the limits of the um, 
the uh, what was sorry what was suggested um by these lines the lower limit so you buy here and you sell here we're well below that buy point and this is the us 500 which is uh, actually if you draw a line down there it's at the top of that line and the question is is it going to fall away and according to that um, that little rule you would say yes it is and this is the point at which you would want to sell the us 500 until the volatility index comes back to here mm. yeah uh, so that's me keith what about you well thank you richard i had a bit of a rubbishy week actually and i'm not sure why sometimes the pnl really confuses me you know i do the numbers and i think actually i should have had a good week and it's down I would have thought you had a better week, Keith, because of yeah. the movement in bonds. Yeah, so would I, frankly. I know I lost money on the dollar, but that was like actually not a big part of the portfolio, and the losses are quite small. But anyway, mm. the numbers show I lost money last week, so there you go. So the um, I was down on 0.5%. The all share was up 1.6%, but I'm still having a good year. Okay, so I completely sold out of the U.S. Uh, Treasury one to three year ETF, making a return of two percent. Obviously, I sold a lot of bit before, and I have been going big into big duration UK bonds. So, but uh, I describe myself as a speculator rather than an investor. I take big decisions, and make big allocations, but then I change my mind quite quickly and I sell, like in the case of the US dollar, just when I decide I'm wrong, I'm out, done. Whereas an investor would take longer term decisions. And so I've now got a lot of risk and this could go spectacularly wrong. Now, if you do these sort of asset allocations, you need to be willing to accept pain in the short term, in the expectation it will come good. Now, I think we are headed into a global recession. Recession will bring down inflation, will bring down interest rates. And if we look at UK bonds, then you know, earlier in the year, just in August, you know, the 2071 was trading at the best part of 90. It's now at 69. And if it goes back to 90, you're talking about a decent return of What's that? 20, 30 percent, you know, tax free, CGT free. So that's what I'm aiming for. And I'm willing to put to put up with quite a lot of volatility and pain mm. in the short term to achieve that aim. And this could go really badly wrong. It's quite easy to see it going down to 16. That's a 15 percent drop, in which case I would lose a lot of money. And this is even more volatile. This is the 2068 index link gilt. And you can easily see this going back to 100. And again, I'd lose you know, 10 or 15%, big part of the portfolio. And that would cause quite a big drawdown in um, my portfolio, but I've had a good year. And I basically, I am a macro investor. We talk a lot of macro on here, and I think that interest rates are peaking and long bond yields will come down as the economy slows. Now, Richard previously talked about the iShares US Treasury 20-year uh, plus ETF, and this is the price. Has that bottomed? Now, Richard obviously would say that that is not yet a trend. It's not. But, you know, on a fundamental view... I think this this rises from here and I retain a position. Okay, that's it. Thank you all for watching. Please, can you press like and subscribe to the channel? And it's goodbye from Richard Wheater. And it's goodbye from Keith Jordan. Goodbye. goodbye. Full disclaimer, the material and information contained in this podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon for making a business, legal or any other decision. We may own or have a financial interest in any securities mentioned. Listeners should conduct their own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. Whilst we endeavour to ensure that the information presented on the show is correct, 
We make no representations or warranties of any kind, expressed or implied, with respect to the podcast and website or to any information, products, services or related graphics discussed or presented in the podcast or website. Any reliance you place on such material is strictly at your own risk. You are solely responsible for the investment decisions you make. We will not be responsible for any errors or omissions in the podcast or website, including in articles or postings, for hyperlinks embedded in messages, or for any results obtained from use of such information. Nor will we be liable for any loss or damage, including consequential damages, if any, caused by a reader's reliance on any information provided by the podcast or website. Please do not listen to the podcast if you do not accept self-responsibility for your actions.